<sighs> you know, I had plans this week. I had plans. They were good plans. Solid plans. <laughs> Not anymore. Has been hotel trailer dropped. You gotta break this sucker down now. Box bites. <laughs> So the whole thing starts with Alistair, now voiced by Amir Talai, trying to pitch the hotel to this one dude shanking his buddy in the street. Now that's the sign of a good businessman. Even first degree murder doesn't get in your way. Heck, even the victim looks like he's kinda digging it too. Though we should probably dig him something in a second since he probably won't last long enough to sign the paperwork. Also, I gotta admit, while I definitely miss Edward Bosco's vaudeville of a voice, Mr. Talai is actually doing a pretty decent job so far. Will he eventually win me over? Maybe. We see Angel Dust at his place of business, and... Okay, I'm clearly no expert in this industry, but does the kind of work Angel does really require much of a script? Ah oh, well, at least we get cameos from Valentino, that one client Angel had in the pilot, and... <laughs> Either that's Angel's fan mailbox, or that's all the angry letters from fans demanding that Michael Korvac come back to voice him. Personally, I still think Blake Roman does a good job with what he's given, especially since he's voicing the show's most iconic character. And hey, at least Michael's off voicing Angel's spiritual successor in another awesome indie cartoon, so it's a win-win. We get a nice overhead shot of the city, and our eyes are immediately drawn to this giant hourglass that towers above everything else, bathed in a bright yellow light compared to the surrounding oranges and reds. It looks like this is a redesign for the old Countdown to Cleanse clock tower that was present in the pilot, but now it's attached to some kind of church-looking building where the exorcists might live. We know that the angels are going to be more prominent characters in the series than they were in the pilot, with the pilot only showing the aftermath of what they did. Heck, Charlie even directly speaks with one of them, named Adam, in a few scenes coming up, probably following up on what was shown in Happy Day in Hell. I'll be honest, I don't really know how I feel about this yet. I kind of preferred when the exorcists were this eerie threat that we never saw in person, but we knew Charlie would have to deal with them eventually. Like in the pilot, they were permanently stationed in heaven, so they were kind of kept in the shadows for the moment. And we only saw an indirect taste of what they were capable of at the beginning of the episode. It all felt very atmospheric and even a little scary. Like the show was hiding a menacing ace up their sleeve that they would play when the time is right. Here they're just showing their full hand with no poker face. This is what the exorcists look like. They're way more goofy than they are threatening, and heck, they're not even in heaven anymore, they're basically your next door neighbors. But hey, just like with all of Vivzy's shows, they always nail things in the execution department, so I'm not too worried right now. Heck, Adam over here is ripping a hot solo in a later clip, so I can't be too mad at his existence. Next up, we got Alistair in the streets talking to... this guy. It almost looks like some kind of Serpentis knockoff, just with a spider motif instead of a snake one. Like he's got the spider necktie and the web lining inside of his cloak. We've also got a whole bunch of eyes cowering in the alleyway here, which I assume is the rest of the gang spying on Alistair from a distance while he tries to work at a business deal. I mean, there is a single eye down here, which definitely looks like Nifty's eye. I'm gonna say that this is a potential client that only Alistair was brave enough to approach, and he brought the Egg Boys along since they're just expendable cannon fodder. Also, a random dude sets himself on fire, which is always a fun time. Then there's the shot of the hotel itself, and it's got a similar look and vibe to the original. Alistair built himself a little makeshift broadcast tower on the top floor, the same one that's likely featured in his redesign reveal. We've got a pirate ship on the right, which was seen in Vaggie's redesign reveal, and they've still got the merry-go-round, though this time it's on a much lower floor. There's also a no vacancy sign on the front, which looks like it was swiped from a motel parking lot, and an entranceway that looks like it was stolen from a matinee theater. I'm not gonna lie, I actually like this design more than the pilots. I mean, when we look at the hotel, we're supposed to get the vibe that these guys are passionate and well-meaning, but they're also kinda destitute and don't really know what they're doing. Like, what exactly was Charlie's idea behind putting things like a ship, a merry-go-round, or a train on our hotel? Oh, we want people to have fun, so put a horsey ride on there. We want to have the hospitality and getaway nature of a cruise vacation, so throw the Titanic on there. Again, well-meaning, but really impractical. The original pulls this off well, but it looks a little bit too well-organized and ornate, like it's all one well-crafted structure. This one looks completely ramshackle though, with the bits seeming like they're about to topple over, and even more pieces that look like they were repurposed from somewhere else. It feels more like a cobbled together piece of junk with no direction, which is exactly what the hotel should look like, so I really dig it. 
We then get a shot of the interior decorated for a welcome party with the entire main cast giving off these nervous, kind of forced looking smiles. Husk especially looks like he's dying inside. And look a little nifty doing a sultry pose on the table. She's so cute. Next is a close up shot of the main cast with everyone just kind of hating to be there. Except Nifty and Charlie, of course, with the latter giving off a smile that could light up a hotel room. And then we get a more direct joke about them being broke when the commercial tells watchers to Come now or don't! I don't care, we still don't have a working phone! I mean, Charlie probably still has her cell phone. You probably could have just left her number there. Don't get me wrong, it's a neat commercial, Al, but you kind of just shot the whole thing in the head by not leaving contact info, my dear. Oh, sorry, too soon. Then Al turns the TV off and we get the only part of the trailer I didn't like. These two voice lines. Alistair's line was delivered fine, but he doesn't have his voice filter on for some reason. Did they decide to change things so Al only has the filter on when he's broadcasting to his audience, and then he talks normally when he's not? Or was it just a mistake in the editing room? Either way, he does sound extremely off without it. Then we get Vaggie's line, which almost sounds like it was recorded in a completely different room with different acoustics. I'm sorry, what the fun was that? Like there's almost some kind of weird echo effect to it or something, or am I the only one hearing that? The devil's in the details a lot of the time, and that's just a weird detail that I noticed. We get a line where Charlie talks about her mission statement of hellish redemption, only to be followed by everybody gearing up for some kind of battle. Jeez, talk about a 180. I'm assuming that they're gonna fight the forces of heaven since they mention that later, but it is still hilarious that these two clips come right after one another. I gotta admit, I'm really digging Serpentis' Captain Crunch cosplay over here. We also got Angel in his gangster getup with a sweet web print Tommy gun, and... What are you planning to do with those sewing scissors, Nifty? After waving at a random fish dude who slings some swears her way, we get to hear Charlie sing her little heart out into Alistair's microphone. And I'm just gonna say it, out of all the recasting choices, Erica Henningsen as Charlie is easily the best one. She's bubbly, she's perky, and she's got a great singing voice. I'll definitely miss Jill Harris's adorable high-pitched delivery, but out of everyone who's next to carry the four-year torch, she definitely does it the best. The song itself is good too. Sounds like typical Broadway affair, which makes sense if you remember the kind of people they hired. We got Vaggy sitting on top of a building, maybe post-extermination, looking down on all the destruction? Or maybe this is just how hell looks on a typical Tuesday night. Then we get Charlie talking with Adam in a very heavenly looking building, which is more than likely the inside of that glowing clock tower church thing that I mentioned earlier. It seems like they're doing a mirror of the new studio scene from the pilot, where Charlie also gets laughed at, gets angry, and then has a breakdown later on when the whole ordeal is over. At the very least, this meeting probably won't be broadcast on public television, so it saves our puppy of a princess from being too embarrassed. Though I'm not gonna lie, seeing her go full demon mode and just deck Adam in the face would be freaking hilarious. Soon after, we get Husk's first spoken line, and... Yep, that's Keith David, alright. Super duper mega talented guy. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't prefer Mick Lauer's more gruff, aggressive sounding voice for Husk. It really did make him sound like a grumpy old man who's just done with life. Meanwhile, Keith David can definitely pull off angry and sinister, but he sounds a little... I don't know, too smooth for Husk? It's a weird complaint, I know, but maybe I'm just too attached to the pilot like some other people. Then we get Cherry Bomb's first line, courtesy of Christina Alabado. And it sounds fine. I was never super attached to Cherry Bomb, so her voice difference was barely noticeable to me. Also, something something as the movie. Here, hold this. Next, we see Charlie strolling through some kind of... I don't know, upper class cannibal part of town with some locals eating a corpse? Ugh, it gives me Fallout New Vegas flashbacks. And if you know, you know. We get another line read from Vaggie, and this one at least doesn't have any audio problems. I'm not huge on the delivery, it just doesn't sound like there's much convincing oomph behind it. In fact, I think Stephanie Beatrice might be my least favorite recast next to Keith David. But just like the Mario movie, we've only heard a few lines from them so far, so I'll give it time. Maybe they'll blow me away when the full show comes out, who knows. Also, I did see a fan theory floating around that Vaggy might have some connections to Angel, since all of the exorcists have an X over one eye, and so does she. 
We know that she's technically a human sinner, so did she used to be in heaven, and then she was indoctrinated into the exorcist due to her strong sense of justice? She got an X placed over the opposite eye to show that she's an honorary member instead of a pure-blooded angel, but eventually quit due to conflicting beliefs? She gets sent to hell due to her betrayal and tries to cover up her eye with an eye patch, but the X still shows up because her betrayal is seen as a grave sin, and sinners always have their wrongdoings painted all over their bodies? We also saw that she had a very familiar looking spear later on. Plus all the exorcists are women and have the same gray and white color scheme that she does. It all ties together really well. Honestly, if they don't go the whole Vaggy used to be an angel route, I'll be pretty surprised since all the evidence is pretty upfront. Anyway, we get some exorcists slaying a few demons and then we get to hear Vox's voice. He honestly sounds a little more dorky than I was expecting. I mean, he's always portrayed as this massive, toothy grin, hypnotic eye, top of hell's food chain monster. And yet he sounds like this. They're gonna fucking die. They're, they're gonna die. I guess I was expecting something a little more... menacing? But we really don't know what his character is yet, so maybe a more casual demeanor will suit him better. Next, we get the entirety of hell singing along with Charlie including Alistair, which really, really surprised me since I thought he was just in this for the sadistic chuckles. Maybe he turns around at the end. That'd be nice. We see Charlie and her dad performing some kind of portal opening incantation where Lucy just shows off all six of his wings. And dang, does he look cool. Oh, impressive wingspan. Very good. Considering the portal's pointing up, and we know that at some point heaven and hell are going to have some kind of war, is Lucifer actually opening up a portal to heaven so that they can take the fight straight to the source? Maybe converse with the much more reasonable man upstairs? Maybe we'll get to see Charlie hug God? I'm still not giving up on that, dang it! Then we got Vaggy with her spear, Charlie doing some magic to light up the place, Vaggy in a ponytail, which is beyond cute, and a massive lime green explosion. I have no idea what caused that thing, but any animation fan will know that lime green is rarely a good color to see, so it was probably some kind of antagonist. We see Charlie reaching up towards the sky to what I think is supposed to be heaven? Or maybe it's like some kind of portal that allows the exorcist to go back to heaven? Maybe it's some kind of Truman Show type beacon so the angels can spy all over hell from the comfort of their church? Whatever it is, it at least makes for a pretty visual. We get another bit from Adam and Charlie's little rendezvous, where we see the aforementioned We also see a rainbow and a little stick demon on this piece of paper that Charlie is holding. So maybe this will be a reference to her foolproof plan from the pilot. You know, singing show tunes equals happy ending? That'd be a cute reference. Then we get a face shot of this woman gazing at the destruction of hell with a clearly uncomfortable smile and fire in her eyes. I want to say this is pre-Hotel Vaggy with the whole ex-angel backstory I mentioned before, like this was her turning point when she realized how wrong this all is, but this girl has freckles and Vaggy doesn't, so maybe this is someone else entirely. And then comes the rapid fire cast list, with some cute scenes attached. Charlie with a well-groomed smiling shrunken head, which is adorable, Vaggy probably right in the middle of her soon-to-be big musical number, Your Angel Dust doing his Angel Dust thing. I hope you like leather. Husk drinking and flipping us off, perfectly in character, and then Alistair going full on demon mode, complete with the full grown horns and tendrils that longtime fans will be familiar with. I'm assuming these attackers might be some literal loan sharks who maybe Charlie owes some money to for the building and they've come to collect. I mean, these guys aren't exactly in the best financial shape right now, so it makes sense if they had to get some funds from some unsavory sources. But luckily, Alistair's here just to skewer all of them and solve the problem instantly. Hooray! Free real estate! It's free real estate. A few quick shots where nothing noteworthy happens, though Angel and Husk potentially doing a musical number together has promise. Then finally, Adam smashes some kind of light projector thing, and the power goes out in the entire pride ring. I do appreciate this overhead shot though, so we can really get a lay of the land. Like we got the hotel over there, that's probably Valentino's studio, the exorcist church clock tower in the middle, the ambiguous angel thingy up there, it all looks really cool. And I like how each district kind of has their own slight tint of color to differentiate them. Makes for a nice looking map. And it all ends with Angel Dust having problems with the script yet again, as he acts out a commercial which I assume Charlie wrote this time. Also, her little reaction to the performance is absolutely precious. It's great, right? Keep going. <sighs> I love her so much. And that's the whole trailer. Overall, solid stuff. Visuals are stunning, music is phenomenal, Charlie sounds near perfect, and they've definitely given us plenty of things to theorize about. 
I do have a few reservations, like there are some casting choices I'm not quite sold on yet. I'm also not sure if I like the idea of the angels actually being stationed in hell instead of them coming down once a year. Not to mention whether or not all of this will line up with the hell of a boss lore that Vivzi's already set up. But hey, all we've got right now are speculations at the moment. And speculation is no substitute for substance. So I'll give them a chance to wow me before I make any definite claims. But until then, what do you guys think? What are your favorite and least favorite parts of this trailer? And what are your takes on my predictions? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in everybody, and I hope to see you all real soon.